Hey there, welcome to the show, the annual 64th show, where we review games that may or may not actually mean anything to the people watching, featuring an intermittent schedule, broken promises, and destroyed dreams. So Crazy Taxi! Sega was all about coming up with dumb, stupid, fun things, and just rolling with them whether they thought it was going to be successful or not. <laughs> And that's one of the many reasons why I love them. Full body motion controls, a fishing rod controller, console hardware add-ons, the VMU, a bloody trucking simulator, doesn't matter. If you can think of it, chances are Sega's done it at least once or twice. I sure hope Sega doesn't make a game where the only way to play it on console is to buy a separate controller for it, otherwise it's unplayable. Oh. And there are a few works from Sega that embody this philosophy more than Crazy Taxi. What can be said about Crazy Taxi that hasn't already been said? Well, I mean, this is definitely something that's never been said about it before. Released in arcades in 1999 on the the venerable Sega Naomi arcade board. Yeah, I don't actually know what this means. Crazy Taxi is a game about the aforementioned eponymous erratic engine. Zipping through the streets of one of two San Francisco-like cities at ridiculous speeds as you drift around, jump over, and speed past traffic, all while picking up and dropping off customers who just so happen to be rich joyriders. I can't wait to see this city's hospital. It started out as an idea that came to Sega employee Kenji Kano while he was stuck in the middle of a traffic jam on his side of the road, but seeing a completely silent and empty lane on the other side wanting to just fly around traffic. And once that initial seed was planted, he knew he wanted to make a racing game of some kind, and the idea came to make it a taxi simulator. Which didn't gel well with Kano's team initially, thinking it was kind of a dumb idea. And now, with hindsight, let's all collectively scoff at the team for initially writing it off, unlike my taxes. And with that, the game would go gold on the 25th of February 1999 in Japanese arcades and became a smash hit for Sega. Receiving generally positive reviews across all the platforms it was released on, from Dreamcast, PS2, GameCube, PC, PS3, Xbox 360, to even iOS and Android if you're into going <laughs> and would sell a million copies across the Dreamcast and PS2 versions alone each, as well as drawing considerable attention from arcade girls at the time. And of course it would, considering you're driving as an adrenaline junkie cabbie with a punk complex, recklessly driving around a densely populated area while blasting pop punk, of course that would stand out next to Chuck E. Cheese's memory match. This is a game I've sunk quite the amount of time into over the years. I've been playing it since I was 11 or 12 with the 360 version on Dreamcast Collection. And while I haven't been playing it constantly since then, I have gotten back into it very recently and I've been hooked. That adrenaline rush and unbridled need for speed are still there whenever I play this game. It's never gotten old and has only gotten better with time in my opinion. And you can bet your ass that it brings back the memories I have of playing this game as a wee youngin on a 360 in front of this tiny CRT TV. Which yes I know I grew up with one of the George Lucas versions of Crazy Taxi but we'll get to that later. So yeah, Crazy Taxi is a timeless classic. It's pick up and play simple, but very difficult to master. It's dated itself so hard with the music and general attitude and most of all, I love it. And it's one of my most favourite games on the Sega Dreamcast. Right up there with Space Channel 5 Part 2, Revolt, and Jet Set Radio. When you think about it, Crazy Taxi ought to make for a crowded mess of ideas, and honestly, it sort of does. But that's why it's great. It's kind of like Hawaiian pizza. Nobody really thought that these bunch of things would work well together, but they really, really do. And in the absence of explanation, it's an endearing experience. And it starts right at the title screen. Hey, hey, come on over, have some fun with Crazy Taxi. What well, I'd give to see that guy's larynx. And here we have the main menu, where first off we've got a choice of arcade and original modes, the difference between them being different maps. So arcade mode gives you the original map from the arcade version, and the original mode gives you an all new map specifically for the console versions. It's a map original to the console versions. This map would be included with every single console port of the game to follow. I never really played the arcade mode that much, but for the sake of review I'll give it as equal time as the original mode that I can, but for now we'll start with the original map. I'm also not going to be touching on Crazy Box since I just don't have a whole lot to say about it, and even if I did, the script is already bloody long enough. And with your map picked, you then pick a character to drive as. There are no differing stats or anything, so they're just skins, but damn, aren't these some bloody skins. Yeah, they have pretty much nothing to them as characters and don't have any long, complicated backstories about crippling Sherbert addictions or something, but they're still so charming and feel right at home with Sega's incredible cast of original characters. Like, seriously, look at them. All. They all look like they came straight out of Jersey Shore. So once you've picked your character, the game begins with a Here we go! And it's here where we're introduced to the game's simple structure. Pick up a customer, take them to their destination within the time limit. Which, in typical Sega driving game fashion, involves going super fast, fun, dumb physics, and a clock to race against. When you think about it, this game is pretty much just driving, driving, 
driving, and maybe some driving every once in a while to spice things up. But that's honestly where the similarities between this and other conventional races end. When picking a customer to give a lift, there's a colour-coded dollar sign floating above their head, which is indicative of how long the trip is and how much money you'll earn, which replaces your score. Green means longer trips that pay a larger amount, featuring more opportunities to pull off tricks, and red is shorter trips that pay less. And obviously you'll want to pick the green or yellow fares for the highest score and most game time possible. Once you get a fare, you're immediately given a timer that floats around your cab that tells you how much time you have left to complete your fare. And depending on how long it takes you to get there, you'll receive one of three different ratings. If you get there while the timer is still green, you get a speedy rating, a larger time bonus and more bonus cash. If the timer is yellow, you'll get a normal rating with a smaller time bonus and little to no bonus cash. If the timer is red, you'll get a slow rating, no bonuses and the passenger kicks your car. Do that again and I'll give you a kick right in your fridge. And if you run out of time, the passenger just yeets themselves out of the cab and you're given a bad rating. Again, I can't wait to see the hospitals. Simple stuff that's easy to pick up and play, sure, but it's hard to master. While you're driving around to drop off customers, you're encouraged to pull off tricks in the game. These tricks include the crazy dash, which makes your car move faster, the limiter cut, which is just doing another crazy dash to make your car move even faster, the crazy jump, which you can do by driving off ramps and ledges. This particular trick gives you extra tips for doing it, as does the crazy through, which is when you're closely dodging cars on the road, as does the crazy drift, which is self-explanatory. And the cities you play in are massive, sprawling playgrounds for honing your skills, just begging for you to drift around every corner, drive through traffic, and leap through the air at every opportunity possible. And let me tell you, there's no feeling quite like the one I get when I burn rubber around the cities at breakneck speeds and complete a fare with that speedy rating, and hear- <coughs> uh, and hearing those glorious sounds. <laughs> The sound of cash jiggling with the chunky thudding of the HUD counting your cash is one of the most satisfying things in gaming to me. Hell, the entire sound design of this game is something I can't get enough of. Everything is loud, aggressive, and suitably over the top. And the game eggs you onto bettering yourself with every playthrough, learning to use the tricks to your advantage, learning the layout of the maps, taking shortcuts wherever possible, and honestly, it's awesome but what ruins it is the controls. Yeah, this is an issue for me. I've never been able to get half the tricks to respond most of the damn time in this game. I couldn't tell you if this has something to do with the emulator I'm using or what, because I haven't a bloody clue. But in my experience, the Xbox 360 version felt like it was performing better and was more responsive. Using the 360 controller helps, even on the Dreamcast version with an emulator. The chunkier, more rigid triggers do this game better justice. And while the 360 version was still far from perfect, I was consistently getting higher ranks on the leaderboard and earning more cash, even on the arcade map, which I thought I hadn't memorized that well. The tricks themselves are awesome, and they feel awesome to pull off, don't get me wrong, but they just flat out don't work half of the time. I'm using Control Scheme B purely because that's the scheme I've been using since I was a kid, so it's the one I'm the most used to, where accelerator's on A, brake is on B, drive gear is on right trigger, and reverse gear is on left trigger. To do a crazy dash, you have to let go of the accelerator, shift into reverse, shift back into drive, and then press the accelerator again, all within a bloody split second. This is what it looks like. And you know what? This isn't a problem. I can do this just fine. It does work most of the time, but for some reason the game sometimes likes to just not register the fact that I'm trying to dash. And the drift has the same problem, which is similar to the dash, but you flip between gears while pressing the accelerator, and holds the drive trigger on the flip while you're turning, and again, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Then there's the fact that the physics seem to change how they behave every five seconds. Sometimes the car's steering is unforgivably tight, where turning is basically impossible, and dodging traffic? Fucking forget about it. Whereas other times, it's it's loose, springy, and fun. The drift and the limiter cut are supposed to help loosen the controls, but again, that only works half of the time. I'm aware of what I'm supposed to be doing, I swear I'm doing this right and it just doesn't fucking work. Then there's collision. Sometimes when I crash into cars and buildings, I only get knocked back just a bit, or I get flung towards Saturn, which isn't a bad thing, I heard they have Daytona USA. And sometimes the game also likes to get me stuck on walls, and no matter what I do in these situations, turning, shifting, gears, braking, doesn't matter, it's all a futile effort. You can kiss even a normal rate goodbye whenever something like this happens. And don't get me wrong, when the game wants to work, it's so much fun. Flying around the streets with the loose, bouncy controls is an adrenaline rush, the likes of which I can't begin to describe. And there are a few games that just capture that pure, visceral feeling of speed and the campy charm that Sega's racing games exude from every corner as much as Crazy Taxi does. It's rivaled only by Outrun in my opinion. But the control and physics problems combined with the spastic arrow on the top of the screen, unforgiving map layouts that don't give you any alternate routes to take that are longer to punish you should you make a wrong turn, and you have an experience that can sometimes be annoying at best and game ruining at worst. Wait, what was that that I said earlier? Crazy Taxi is a terrible sport.
Actually, no, I take that back. Like, Woo Lad, does it feel like a taxi simulator that came out in 1999 on the venerable Sega Naomi arcade board, all right? But hey, let's push the negativity off to the side for the moment, because there's other good shit in this game that needs discussing. The soundtrack, in my opinion... It was a good choice! That was a good choice! That was a good choice! I've never really listened to Offspring and Bad Religion before, but I don't think there ever could have been a better pick for the soundtrack. As someone who grew up with the 360 version, which had a selection of songs from bands like Lions Lions, The Juliet Daggers, The Hooks, and others, bands I've never even heard of before, I can easily say that the original soundtrack is far superior. When I first played the Dreamcast version, I said on Twitter that I preferred the original soundtrack because I'm nostalgic for it, but honestly, I've actually forgotten all of the tracks from the 360 version, except for the demo theme, main menu theme, and cact select theme, which were the main ones I was referring to in that tweet. Whether it has to do with the passage of time, or just because the Dreamcast version has less tracks, making you more likely to hear the same tracks repeat in a single playthrough, I'm not sure, but either way, I can definitively say that the original soundtrack soundtrack is a much better fit for this game. Now to be fair, it's not like it's a deal breaker for me, as long as it's era appropriate pop punk we all good, but again, I do agree that the original holds the crown. And as a quick aside, the 360 version actually sounds worse than the Dreamcast version. Hey hey! Come on over, have some fun with Crazy Taxi! Hey hey, come on over, have some fun with Crazy Taxi! The sound effects have been compressed, and I understand why it was an early Xbox Live arcade release from 2010, meaning that the game had to be under 350 megabytes in size at the time, but that don't make it any more okay. I was actually blown away from hearing how clear the Dreamcast version sounded. It was almost like playing a remastered version of a game I'd loved since childhood that was released 11 years before my childhood version even came out. Another thing that got changed in these re-releases is some of the graphics. The game itself looks decent for the time. I would have said the polygon count could have done with an increase since it looks worse than the Dreamcast version of Daytona USA, but even though the Dreamcast could have easily rendered more polygons on screen at once, they couldn't fit it into RAM, since this is a massive open world for the Dreamcast after all. Hell, they already had issues fitting everything into the Dreamcast's RAM compared to the Naomi board, but the graphics that were changed in the re-releases is the real world of businesses. Yeah, the original versions of the game on these platforms have real world locations. Along Alongside generic places, real world companies like KFC, Tower Records, Pizza Hut, Levi's, and a bunch of others actually appear as locations in this game that you can drive to. And these locations were changed in the re-releases and replaced with even more generic locations. But again, this is one of those things that I'm not too bummed out by. Honestly, whether they're there or not doesn't matter to me all that much, I just thought it was worth noting, since I know it bothers some people for some reason, but to each their own, I guess. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is Crazy Taxi, a game with a simple premise and pretty good execution. Ignoring my personal problems with the controls, I just can't hate this game. I can't even not like the game. And setting aside my own nostalgia for a second, the amount of fun I have with this game is matched by very few races in my opinion. And the physics as well, while really fun, can unfortunately be a source of frustration for some, but I guess you can make the buggy physics a bit more interesting if you played it while drunk or high or something. And that soundtrack, just too bloody perfect. There's also the sequel, starting with Crazy Taxi 2, which weirdly enough never got an arcade release, it was put straight on the Dreamcast and was unfortunately mostly forgotten. It's more of the same, but includes two different maps based around New York, group fairs, a new set of minigames in the Crazy Pyramid, along with a new soundtrack from the returning Offspring and Methods of Mayhem, as well as a new cast of characters. It also features a new trick, the Crazy Hop, which lets you jump in the air at the press of the Y button. you think this could be easily abused, opening a pathway to breaking the game, but actually no. There's a pretty long delay between pressing the button and you actually jumping, and the amount of traffic on the road makes it so that you can't just cheese everything. If you want more Crazy Taxi, here's more Crazy Taxi, and if you haven't played Crazy Taxi before, well, this isn't a bad place to start, but I personally recommend you start with the original. There's also Crazy Taxi 3 High Roller for the original Xbox, which I haven't played, but I've heard it's pretty great. And yes, out of all of Sega's Dreamcast franchises to get trilogies of, it wasn't Space Channel 5, it wasn't Jet Set Radio, you know, games that had more meat on them and could have easily been expanded upon in so many cool ways, no, it was fucking Crazy Taxi, and I'll never get over that. Then there's Crazy Taxi Fair Wars for the PSP, which is a collection of all the content from the first two games into one. And finally, there's the mobile games, Crazy Taxi City Rush and Crazy Taxi Tycoon, both of which make me want to go... This game feels like a weird lightning in a bottle type situation, or if you really stop and think about it for a second, you say to yourself, there's no way this game could possibly be real. But it is. It is very real. And it is very much a classic. A classic that I recommend you play. If you want to experience the Dreamcast and what it's all about, play this game. It's dumb, campy, silly fun. Be it a bit frustrating at times, and a little bit repetitive. And it's a real shame, at least in my opinion, that we haven't seen a proper evolution of the series yet. Sure, the sequels are good games, and they are more Crazy Taxi, but that's really all they are. If you've played one, you've played them all. Mostly. 
<laughs> Feel that? So it's a feeling of mediocrity filling the air, kind of like how this show does. And with that, I feel like it's time for us to wrap up here. So, as we come to a close on this momentous occasion, I shall leave you all with my utmost thanks and gratitude for being as patient as you have been as I get this video done. I know it's been too long, but hey, I'm back. And we should be back in the business from here on out. Until I start going to university next March. But hey, don't you frown, we've still got three whole months left before that happens. And in that time, I'm gonna be putting out this video. See you next year.